Hi everyone, this is Doug with B&H, and this is part two of our three-part series on 4K video production. Remember, although this is geared towards 4K production, most of what I'll be showing you can also be applied to HD production as well, or SD if you're still doing that. In part one, we covered cameras, lenses, and media selection. But what are you supposed to do with all that footage after your shoot has wrapped? Much like the camera you chose, the platform you're editing on has a lot of variables to consider, including the video format, your deadlines, the amount of VFX and finishing involved, and destination medium. Basically, the scale of your production means you may or may not need to invest in certain hardware or use a more advanced post-production workflow. We're going to break this video down into ingestion and storage, computer hardware, and editing workflow to give you an idea of what's possible. Now, before we begin, keep in mind that the decisions we make in this video directly tie into part three, which will cover color grading workflows and exporting your finished video. To begin, let's start by ingesting some of the footage we shot from part one. On a set, a data wrangler or DIT might be managing this data for you, but regardless of production size, the footage should be organized, copied to redundant storage, and checked for errors. A common example is to use a laptop connected to a small RAID storage system such as this 8 terabyte array from G Technology. You can later transfer this to a larger storage system if you want, or you can simply use a larger RAID during the ingest stage itself that will later be used for the edit. We've connected this via Thunderbolt with our card reader on USB 3 to keep the read and write processes on separate connections. Now, it's understandable that time and budget constraints might limit exactly how you handle your footage, so while I highly recommend you use redundant storage when ingesting and editing, a simple external hard drive can work in a pinch, but you should copy this to another system as soon as possible. When copying your footage, you should use software that can perform error checks, and preferably a program that can organize and automate the entire process, like Hedge or Shotput Pro. We'll organize this footage by day, camera, and card. Now back in part one, we mentioned how your storage considerations have a lot to do with the camera you're using. We shot with three cameras, four formats, and across three days. Now we didn't have the same amount of footage each day, but to prepare, we can make some educated guesses based on the formats we're shooting with. All of our cameras utilized some variant of H.264 compressed video with bit rates of 100 megabits per second, 150 megabits per second, and 410 megabits per second, along with a handful of ProRes recordings that also run around 440 megabits per second, we're looking at anywhere from roughly 750 megabytes per minute to 3 gigabytes per minute, depending on the bitrate and amount of footage. Using a shooting ratio of, say, 10 to 1 means that if you're making a 10-minute video, you should account for about 100 minutes of footage. If everything were at our highest bitrate, this would mean storing about 300 gigabytes of footage. For a feature film, especially documentaries, this presents an enormous challenge as you can easily store multiple terabytes of raw camera footage. Speaking of raw, if you do intend to shoot raw 4K video, be prepared to use a lot of hard drive space. Now, generally speaking, you want your source footage to be on the fastest drive and connection possible so that your playback in the edit is smooth. With that said, let's move on to computer hardware. While small two-bay RAID setup is a good balance of portability and storage on set, you'll probably want a more robust RAID setup for your workstation. A four-bay solution like the G-Speed Studio Series, configured in what is known as RAID 5, is ideal as it provides excellent speed and redundancy in case of hard drive failure. But what about the actual computer? Many people are right to be concerned about what it actually takes to cut 4K video. And while it is generally true that the bigger and faster your computer is, the smoother your edit will go, depending on the scale of your production, budget involved, and deadline, you might be surprised what you can get away with. We won't get into the nitty gritty of building an entire computer, but we are going to give you some guidelines that can help in selecting a pre-built or even in building your own. In general, these days, the more cores you can get in a computer, the better off you are for editing video, as today's non-linear editors, whether they be Adobe Premiere, Avid Media Composer, or Final Cut Pro 10, make excellent use of multi-core systems. A system with four cores, for example, would be a starting point, but I personally suggest going with at least six cores if possible. Modern NLEs also benefit greatly from a high-end graphics card or GPU. The GPU helps dramatically in decoding and scrubbing through video along with rendering, 
but do take note that the amount of VRAM on board the GPU is also important when it comes to supporting multiple 4K monitors if you choose to do so. As a starting point, mid-range cards like the AMD Radeon RX 580 or NVIDIA GeForce 1060 are great for this at a very good price point. On the higher end, you might want to try a card like the GeForce 1080. When it comes to memory, 16 gigabytes should be considered the minimum, and if you start dealing with programs like After Effects, you'll definitely want at least 32 gigabytes or more. To give an idea of the kind of performance we can get, here's our in-house Mac Pro. This particular unit has an 8-core Xeon processor, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and dual 6 gigabyte GPUs. As you can see, I can scrub through raw footage pretty easily, and even footage with multiple effects and layers plays pretty smoothly. I've cut playback resolution to half to make it a little easier, but the computer keeps up anyway. Now at home, I've got a 6-core i7 processor, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and a single 2 gigabyte GPU. Realistically, I could probably use more system RAM, but it still cuts fairly smoothly for a much more affordable system. However, the real difference in what these computers can and can't do is best illustrated by the type of editing workflow you follow. Now, when I say editing workflows, what I'm actually talking about is the entire post-production pipeline as a whole. We just tackled how powerful your computer could be, but in terms of production, there are a few more questions that need to be asked. Are you going to or want to perform extensive color grading work? How many programs and possibly people are going to be working on this? And most importantly, what is the expected turnaround time for your video? With today's tools, titling, effects, color, and even some audio mixing can be done to some extent in the nonlinear editor alone. For those of you on the Adobe Creative Suite, this is especially true given the dynamic link integration with After Effects and the addition of tools like Lumetri Color. For smaller productions and quicker turnarounds, this kind of workflow is ideal for the following reasons. Depending on your computer's capabilities, most 4K video can be imported and edited entirely within Premiere alone. You don't necessarily need to work with proxies, saving you lots of transcoding time and hard drive space. This video, for example, was made without the use of proxy files. If you do need proxies, most NLEs can generate and manage these internally, rather than forcing you to manually reconnect files at a later point. Keeping the timeline exclusively within your editor avoids any complications with exporting between programs. Basic color grading, titling, and sound mixing can be done within Premiere. If you need something a little more advanced, After Effects integration allows you to quickly work between programs. Now this is a perfectly reasonable approach to production that has become more embraced every year as tools have matured. If you're creating video for the web, corporate videos, events, interviews, short form documentaries, and even some commercials, an all-in-one approach is often more than enough. What's also very important to keep in mind is the final delivery. Chances are that even if you shoot the original material in 4K, your final product will still only be seen in 1080p or 2K. Don't assume this, but do plan around it if it's known, because 4K production offers a few benefits in post. Let's say you shot in 4K, but are mastering and delivering in 1080p. Your storage and hardware considerations immediately come down. You can either transcode everything to 1080p from the get-go, or simply work within a 1080p timeline and reduce your playback resolution. If you do stick to the original footage, but within a 1080p timeline, you also gain the advantage of reframing your video. I wouldn't normally recommend this, as it's far better to obtain the correct shot during production, but in a pinch, you can recompose and punch in on a shot, perform a digital camera move, or even create a close-up of an existing shot to avoid jump cuts or make room for graphics. To give you an idea of just how much leeway you have with 4K, while we've edited and uploaded this video in 4K, if it were only 1080p, the source footage would still be under 100% scaling. This level of flexibility is only possible with today's NLEs. And as I said before, this video series was cut, colored, and mixed entirely within Premiere. But for many productions, especially those on the higher end, this workflow won't quite cut it. Advanced color grading, proxy generation, and external visual effects means editing starts not in your NLE, but in a program like DaVinci Resolve. We're going to tackle this kind of workflow in part three, as it requires a completely different approach to your edit, along with many more considerations at each step. Well, that's it for part two. We'll see you next time.